my talk. Here we go. Uh. Ah, he said he living life as a gringo. Where you question, where you fit, and every time you mingle, they say you do this with not enough that. My rapping is really bad. <laughs> this life as a gringo. Yes, hello and welcome to another episode of Life as a Gringo. I am Dramos, of course. Man, so much going on this month, and today's a very important episode. I think I like to say they're all important, but this one specifically is very near and dear to my heart. Um, June is a, a beautiful month in general. We talked about this last week, but it's Pride Month and, and so many you know uh, reasons to celebrate and, and make sure we have visibility for those who you know, uh, have been voiceless traditionally and, and make sure we continue the conversations around inclusion and diversity and all those different things. And um, a lot of Puerto Rican related festivities happening in the New York City area. I was actually DJing the 116th Street Festival on Saturday. Sunday was the New York uh, Puerto Rican Day Parade. I know Chicago, there's a bunch going on as well, if I'm not mistaken, this week or last week. Um, but June is is also Men's Mental Health Awareness Month. And specifically this week, is International Men's Health Week. And if you are somebody who has listened to this podcast on a regular basis, you know how important the topic of mental health has been to me. We speak about it quite often. Um, maybe to some people's um, you know, chagrin, if you will, uh, that it, we speak about it a bit too much. But the topic of mental health is very near and dear to my heart as somebody who has struggled with things like depression and anxiety for as long as I can personally remember. And I think specifically really looking at it from a a perspective that is not spoken about enough, you know, and obviously we all struggle, everybody's struggle is relevant, but there is quite often a stigma around men and their emotions, their feelings, specifically when you talk about our community, our culture, I mean, I think in general, men often bear the burden of having to be tough and having to have it all together and, and bear the the brunt of, of, you know, not being able to be vulnerable or emotional, right? We always have to be strong and that's a sign of masculinity, right? And I think in our culture, it, it may even be far more drastic, you know? I know it's it's far more normal for us in, in the Latin culture and specifically communities of color to never talk about our feelings, right? And and to never express any real emotions outside of anger because they could be viewed as, as weakness, essentially, right? And I know this has definitely been something I struggled with and I think for a long time, you know, didn't feel like I could totally express myself. And, and I think as a result, you know, my mental health struggled for a long time and still at times continues to um, sort of bubble up and, and I have to kind of work through that still. So I really wanted to just talk about mental health from the men's perspective and i think whether you know you are a, a man or a woman or um identify as, as as you know whatever it is you you choose to identify um i think this is a important conversation to be had because it's not spoken about quite enough and i think that it's important for all of us to sort of have a seat at the table and be able to express all that we're going through and to have a better understanding um, and and to be able to just have open dialogue about the things that we struggle with. And I think that's the only way that we really can feel seen and, and also be there for the people that we care about, you know, and be there in a very real way and, and also maybe curve a lot of the toxic results that happen as a result of people not feeling like they could share themselves or or be vulnerable. So today's episode, I think, whether you are a man or not, this is a relevant conversation um, to to have a, just, I think, a better understanding of the human condition as a whole and, and how we all can sort of do our part to making our interactions with each other and, and the world as a whole just a bit healthier, I guess. So that's going to be today's conversation. Uh, no Ask a Gringo on today's show. I, I just kind of want to get into an article that I read that that had some really interesting sort of facts and statistics, uh, as well as just sort of give you my own personal experience. I know I've talked a lot about my own mental health struggles, but specifically from the perspective of a man, and you know, I don't think I've de delved into that too much about dating and you know, um, sort of lack of safe spaces that there are as a man and how that has affected me internally and i think also those in in my life you know um that I've, I've been seeing recently as i sort of 
educate myself and become more open to it, it's, it's far easier to kind of watch it unfolding for others around me. So I want to share a bit about that and, um, you know, my own struggles and, and how I've sort of dealt with it throughout the course of my life. And uh, we'll get into that for our Me Hint This segment. But first, I want to just kind of get into this article that I found to be really interesting. It had some interesting facts and statistics um, and just theories around the idea of men's mental health that I think were, were really eye-opening. So we'll we'll dive into that in a second. We call for the people in the back. Say a lot for the people in the back. All right, so I pulled an article from AAMC and uh, their official sort of about us. They are a not-for-profit association dedicated to transforming health through medical education, healthcare, medical research, and community collaborations, aamc.org. And I, I just stumbled across, across this article here, and uh, I just thought it, it brought up some really fascinating statistics and ideas and theories and and things that i really resonated with the article is called men and mental health what are we missing it's by derek m griffith a phd ao uh ojubi yi i'm sorry if i i mispronounced that mph and emily yeager mph and they they really kind of just come out swinging with a really startling statistic that i think really sets the tone for all that we're talking about and why this month and, and the idea of men's mental health awareness is so incredibly important. They say men in the United States die by suicide at a rate four times higher than women. Four times higher than women, men are dying by by suicide. And yet men are diagnosed with depression and mood disorders at far lower rates. So men are being diagnosed with mental health issues at a far lower rate than women, yet are committing suicide at a rate four times higher than women. And obviously, there could be a number of reasons for this. I mean, just on the surface, my own reaction as I'm thinking, like, well, how could this be? Aside from maybe not being diagnosed, my, my theory is also, are men lying to their doctors or their physicians or holding back certain things because they don't want to be labeled as depressed or have some sort of disorder that they now have to own up to, right? A title. And I think maybe that is also a part of it. You know, obviously I'll read a bit more in, in the article and, and hear some of their theories, but, you know, truthfully, I I see a therapist, you know, uh, biweekly at this point. We've, I've been seeing him for the last year or so, a little over a year. Uh, before that, I, you know, I've been in and out of therapy for years at this point since my, my mid-20s. But I'd be lying if I said there weren't times that I held back a bit out of fear that they might say, hey, there's something maybe a little bit more seriously wrong that we should, you know, look into with you, right? There are times where maybe I'm having darker thoughts than I would let on. And I'm just being honest here, and I've never really said this out loud before, but I, I think it's obviously important. And I, to be quite frank, I don't feel 100% comfortable even saying this stuff right now, but I know in reading that that just first paragraph from this, this article and that statistic, um, obviously something is awry, and, and if me sharing that maybe – make somebody feel a little bit more comfortable. I hope that that's, that's, that's the case. It's worth it for me, you know, but yeah, I, I definitely hold back. I definitely don't want the labels, the stigma, you know, of, um, you know, I've gotten over sort of the idea of being depressed and, and being okay with saying it, but further than that, you know, of thoughts of self harm or anything like that, like that's heavy shit. Right. And uh, in, in, in society that's like, oh, you should be in a locked in a padded room with, you know, like a vest tying up your arms or something like that. And, um, I think, I think there's like this judgment that comes along with it. And I think, uh, even as a man, it's like, almost feels like this weakness, right? I'm not supposed to ever feel that deeply almost, you know? And, and I definitely would hold back at times things for my therapist and, and obviously it's not healthy or not good. Um, but it's a, it's a reality. You know, and and I think that maybe contributes to why men are not diagnosed 
at the same rate because they're, we're not as open, you know? I mean, shit, I'm somebody who's been going to therapy for years, loves therapy, talks about mental health, and talks about himself in a very vulnerable way for a living, and I still feel uncomfortable at times disclosing some of the darker parts of, of my, my mind almost, you know? Like, it doesn't feel like there's a space anywhere that is completely safe for that, you know? Um, and obviously, I'm not doing myself any favors by holding that stuff in, but it's sort of been trained inside of me, you know, ingrained inside of me to be fearful of sharing some of those things for fear of judgment, really. That's that's the biggest thing. Um, and, and we'll get more into, you know, obviously my, my story and things like that, but I want to continue on with this article. And they reference COVID, right? The pandemic, they say, quote, the COVID-19 pandemic exacerbated the crisis of men's mental health. Studies found that during the pandemic, U.S. men reported slightly lower rates of anxiety than women, but had higher rates of depressive symptoms and suicidal ideation than their female counterparts. Consequently, at one point in 2020, the rates of men seeking mental health care services in the United States increased more than fivefold over the prior year. These rates were greater than the rates of women seeking mental health care services during the time. Yet, by 2021, just 40% of men with a reported mental illness received mental health care services in the past year, compared with 52% of women with a reported mental health illness, according to the National Institute of Mental Health, right? So, 40% of, of men who uh, reported having mental health uh, issues got help, while over half, 52% of women did. So obviously men are, are getting help, as we've seen, at a lower lower rate here. And and I think, you know, I think, uh, I don't know, COVID was an interesting kind of time period. I'm trying to like put myself back in in that place. And I don't, I think it was tough for, for all of us in different ways. But again, I think in just social dynamics of men and women, you know, traditionally and and obviously I'm I'm kind of casting a wide net here but I know for me as a man and, and my friend groups it's it's rare for us to just like sit down and get on the phone to bs with one another right and I think for women that's far more a part of the norm you know of, of staying in contact with your friends and having group con- you know messages and all these different things and I think as a result and obviously we all struggled but theorizing here for myself yeah, I would imagine like as a man, I'm not really calling up my friends during the pandemic and like, hey, let's just chat on the phone. I can remember I had one friend who was kind of good about it and, and he started you know, sort of doing it every once in a while. Uh, he might, honestly, it might have only just been once. And I remember just finding it weird. Like, why is why is he calling me? And not because I don't like him or anything like that. It was just out of the norm. And it was for no reason other than just to kind of BS and talk. And you know, it was nice, but I found it to be strange. And it wasn't something that I continued on, you know, because again, it's so ingrained in me, like, we're, I'm not we're not getting on the phone to just chit chat with one another, you know. And for me, my social interactions during that time came from work. You know, luckily, at the time, I had a, had a roommate. So we had some interaction, not much, really, you know, you know, you're kind of doing your own thing. Um, and at the time I was in a relationship, you know, but if it wasn't really, to be quite honest, if it wasn't for work and that relationship, I probably would have, would have gone crazy. And, and, and to be completely honest, I actually, I went through a breakup during COVID and I got severely depressed afterwards, uh, not just like from the breakup, you know, itself, but more so that was when like the loneliness really hit me you know when friday came along you know after after doing my work week and coming back to my apartment and my roommate was gone he would go visit his family you know during that that time um i was a little bit more cautious with with my parents you know um and their their health issues and things like that so i was sitting at home friday night saturday sunday all day and I got super lonely and super depressed during that time period. I did my best to keep myself busy, but you know, it was kind of the the same shit. I wasn't going to go call one of my buddies and let's chit chat, you know, with each other on the phone just because that always felt odd to me. And I can imagine and that I was lucky that that was sort of like that breakup happened towards the end of of the summer of 2020. So I you know, kind of the the worst parts of the pandemic I at least had somebody to talk to every day and then spend all my weekends with. 
whereas, you know, I can imagine others who maybe didn't have that outlet or for whatever reason, their social interactions with their family didn't provide them with, you know, that that emotional outlet. I can imagine for a lot of men to, to struggle during that point, because, again, it's not something we shared. It's not the norm for us to just call up our buddy and, and talk on the phone for an hour about nothing. Um, you know, I, that's 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 rare, at least for me and, and my group of friends. And I feel like, I you know, um, I hope that I'm, I'm in like the minority there. I know that that's not healthy, but I feel like that's probably more of the norm than than not, you know. Um, and and yeah, moments like the pandemic or moments when you're going through it in general, just life and human experience, I think as men, we bottle a lot of shit up. We're not sort of just letting it out and and having a conversation with somebody, you know, um, unless you are, are one of the ones who has really bought into the idea of therapy and things like that, which obviously is less than, than half of the men diagnosed with, with mental health issues. Now, moving on to the conversation around like treatment and things like that. Uh, in the article, they go on to say, quote, even when men seek care, that care often falls short. Data from Canada and the United States found that more than 60% of men who died by suicide had accessed mental health care services within the previous year. When men do seek mental health care services, it is not uncommon for them to feel that providers mislabel and underestimate their needs and that these providers do not seem to have a genuine interest in their problems. For some time, research has shown that mental health providers may miss or misdiagnose psychological problems in men because of their own gender biases. They might believe that men simply need to, quote, man up and stop showing weakness or that the symptoms they present are not consistent with diagnostic tools. Mental health providers may not consider that there are tools do not take into account gender differences in experience or symptoms that men are more likely to exhibit. Now, I do want to like make a, I don't know if it's a declaration or whatever it might be. I know that there is a large widespread problem of women, specifically women of color, not getting proper health care from doctors for many of the reasons even listed above of not sort of believing them. And I think it's, I know it's a touchy subject specifically in today's day and age to sort of have any sort of like empathy for men. And maybe this is a part of, of part of the issue as well currently, you know, but I know that it's like, okay, listen, you know, women have been ignored for so long and and so it's like men we don't want to hear your complaints or or whatever it might be and i think two things could be true i think we can definitely admit and try and correct the problem that has happened with women being ignored in almost every facet of society from health to careers to to you know home life while still acknowledging there are discrepancies that also happen for men or places that as a society we fall short for men and acknowledging one doesn't take away from the other i think we can we can you know walk and chew gum at the same time as they say right and i think this is a a great sort of point they bring up especially the idea of like quote manning up right and I think what people forget aren't as keen to aren't as on top of is the fact that as kids, it's ingrained in us from a very young age that feelings are bad, expressing hurt, expressing pain is bad. You have to man up, right? The idea of throw some dirt on it, you'll be fine. And I think there's a, a healthy balance, right? Because I think life is hard and we don't want to baby kids to not then be able to handle all that life throws at them but i think there has to be a happy medium ground where we also say yeah toughness is an asset but not like blind toughness where we bury shit down basically right and giving people a safe space to express their emotions their pain and their hurt um doesn't weaken them you know i think i think in fact if we begin to view vulnerability as a strength, which it actually is, um, maybe that it begins to take us on the the right path, you know, of of correcting some of these problems as well. And 
I mean, obviously, these are things I'm going to get into a bit more when it comes to, you know, talking about my own childhood and things like that. But I think it's it's not out of the realm of possibility to think that you go to a doctor who is sort of maybe of another generation and has subscribed and been raised on the idea of man up, toughen up, stop complaining. And they have their own bias when they hear a man who on the surface seems like he's having a great life and to them is just being bothered by the minorest of, of inconveniences, right? And I'm going to touch on this. I keep like previewing what we're going to talk about, but I'm going to touch on this from an interaction I recently had with somebody that I was, I was uh, you know, talking to that I was seeing for a little bit dating. And it was like the idea that I could be depressed or have things that bother me, or let's just say complaints, even though I, I would hate phrasing what I was sort of expressing as that. But on the surface, the idea that I could have complaints when I have a very blessed life, it was it was the notion of like, you're basically just being a baby. And that was sort of what I was met with. And I'll dive a bit more into that, but it's because it's a common thing. And that was coming from a woman, right? Because we're all sort of products of this society that tells us what a quote unquote real man is or tells us that if on the surface your life is great, you shouldn't have any, you're not allowed to complain basically, right? And I think that sort of like notion of like, you're just not grateful. You're not depressed. You're just lack gratitude. Those are all very toxic ideas that oftentimes get spewed at people trying to express themselves and express depression or anxiety. And it's like a belittling that happens. And and sometimes it's from people not even trying to be belittling, but they are, they are, are lessening your experience or what you're going through or the idea that you have clinical depression and they are, are are sort of telling you to put it to the side because you have nothing to complain about right and you hear that enough times you then begin to just hold these things internally until you can no longer hold them inside right um now continuing on in the article they say quote for men to seek mental health care in the first place is already a challenge with social barriers such as social uh, societal stigma, fear of judgment, and lack of skills to communicate emotions keeping many from doing so. It's unconscionable that bias and a lack of effective treatment approaches on the part of mental health providers would create even more barriers. Men do bear responsibility to seek help, but it's far from illogical when they choose to avoid it. Uh, they go on to end with um, the fact that Men are diagnosed with depression at lower rates than women, despite their higher rates of suicide, substance use, and violent behavior, suggests that more could be done to improve the tools used to diagnose men with depression. And I love that that one line. They said, men do bear responsibility to seek help, but it's far from illogical when they choose to avoid it. Yes, we're all our own person. We are responsible for our actions as adults. But I'm a big picture thinker. I don't just live on the surface because everything to me has has a deeper story beneath it. We have to ask those questions, right? And absolutely, a man, let's say, going out and reacting in violence to a minor inconvenience is unacceptable. But if we really want to solve it, right, it's the idea of treating the symptom rather than the disease. If we really want to actually cure the disease, we have to dig deeper into that man's story, right? Why is it that he is set off by the smallest thing, the seemingly smallest thing? What is he actually really fighting, right? And and also this point, this idea where you talk about higher rates of suicide, we mentioned that, but substance abuse and violent behavior, right? I think it's easy to sort of just write off, oh, men are violent. This is what men do. And I think maybe there's some logic in the things that we as men find fun or entertaining versus women i you know maybe there's there's some sort of genealogy there but i would also question maybe it's also this is our only accepted outlet of releasing our frustrations right and 
because we don't realize that, we end up sort of bottling them up until they come out in the wrong places. And to be quite frank, I think there is something healthy about like physical contact or obviously exercise and things like that. But I think just being able to release some of that pent up aggression physically, there is something healthy to that, right? Even when I went away to that retreat, the Hoffman process, they had us like beat the shit out of pillows with a wiffle ball bat for like 10 minutes straight, right? And people were, you would scream out different things and whatever, whatever you were imagining at the time. And that one didn't really work that well for me. But for some people, it was like, oh, this is like relief I needed, you know? But even now, you know, for me, I've been looking into like taking like boxing classes or kickboxing. And it's like, okay, just because I feel years or or just in general from life, the stress or pent up aggression that happens. And there are times where I feel like I want to lash out physically, not necessarily at a person even, but I just feel like I need to get this energy out of me and I want to like punch a wall. And I'm not proud of that, but there are times where I'm like, thank God I'm, I've done the work that I have where I'm mentally in control of not just punching a hole in my wall where I, I weigh the pros and cons of that. But I think there was a time when I was younger where I would just punch something. You know, punch my car or punch what I would. And now with maturity and therapy and, and learning more about myself, there's like a buffer that happens where there's a conversation happening internally, a dialogue that keeps me from lashing out in stupid ways. But Not everybody has gone through that work or accepted it or even feels okay about talking about these things. Um, and they're not looking for like, oh, let me let it out in a healthy, controlled environment like a kickboxing or boxing class where I could just punch a, a weight bag and get it out. A lot of people are going out in the street and taking it out on random individuals for the most minor inconveniences. And again, everybody's responsible for their own actions. But if you're not taught what's actually happening, Right? You think, oh, I'm justified in punching somebody for stepping on my sneaker or because they accidentally spilled a drink on me. right? I'm justified in that. Or I'm going to pick a fight with somebody just because I'm in the mood to. In their mind, because they've never been taught better or haven't been taught proper healthy channels of letting this type of stuff out, in their mind, they're justified in some sort of way for doing so. And actually, they're celebrated by those around them. right? There's nothing cooler than... The guy who is the toughest one in your crew, right? He is just viewed as the man. And women love him. The guy friends all want to be him. They want him around, right? When they get into a fight at a bar, it's laughed about and celebrated. I had I have one friend, a couple of friends, but one specifically. There's probably a 50-50 chance when you go out with him where he's going to end up getting into a fight. 50-50 chance. For the dumbest things ever. And at times, it's almost things that he brings on himself. Like, talking to a girl that's obviously with another guy and then getting mad at the guy when the guy tells him to, ba tells him to back off. Or, again, the most mi just minor fucking inconveniences and he's ready to fight and enjoys it. And he's obviously got a lot of pent up shit that he hasn't dealt with. And I don't really hang out with him anymore like that or I haven't in years. Because it got old for me. I didn't find that cool. But guess what would happen? He'd get into a fight. We'd all get kicked out. And then we'd be back at somebody's house or on our way home bragging about how, you know, reliving every moment of the fight about how he beat some guy up. And that was considered cool. And it was like, all right, let's fucking go back and do it again Saturday. It's like, what are we talking about? Like, in my mind now, I can't even fathom that. Like, you really would have to be putting myself in danger or the, the person that I'm with, the people that I'm with in some sort of danger in order for me to want to enact violence upon you in a bar or a club. Like, I'm there to have fun. I'm there to relax. Why would I go out? And want to get into a physical altercation with a random human being and ruin the entire purpose that I went there with. Like, but again, 
that's normalized in our society and that's cool, right? Especially men of a certain age. And honestly, I hate to even say a lot of those people that I know still keep that same sort of mindset. And again, it's a lot of unresolved issues, a lot of things that haven't been addressed. And rather than digging deep and healing them, they have normalized the idea of recklessly releasing those emotions in situations that do not call for them and have little to you know to nothing to do with why they're actually upset. And I think that's a, a big part of the stigma around men's mental health and talking about our feelings. A lot of that shit just gets buried down and it comes out in, in the worst possible places. So uh, again, big shout out to AAMC for that article. I'll put the link to it in the show notes. Um, I think from the staggering statistics about suicide, men versus women, the theory about medical bias, and I think just in general about men not sharing emotions, you know, and uh, and and not opening up or, or maybe even being open to the idea of getting help even when they've been diagnosed, right? So I think all that is just really interesting statistics to, to kind of hear um, from, from mental health professionals and people who do this for a living. Now, with that said, I want to kind of share some different experiences I've had recently, ones I haven't shared on the show before when talking about mental health. Um, and and I think for me, how mental health has affected me as a man and and even now, the conversations I have to keep having with myself to remind myself that I'm coming from a healthier boundary driven perspective and some of the people I'm interacting with are still living in old societal norms and I can't allow that to make me deviate back into toxic behavior. I think that's a realization I'm having recently and I want to get into that in our Mi Gente segment. Mi gente. All right, so I've, I've obviously talked a lot about my own personal experiences around mental health. If you're new here, you can go back. We we did an episode uh, last season, you know, Gringo's Guide to Mental Health 2, I think it was, and then we did one with the first season. I've talked extensively about sort of my family and that experience and, and not, you know, sort of feeling seen and, and like I could talk about depression, all those things. I've talked about my struggle with it personally. So you can go back and listen to those things, but specifically from the perspective of like men's mental health, and how I've noticed it in dating, right? I'm I'm uh, back on the the dating field out here. You know, I'm I'm getting my feet wet again. I'm I'm um, coming out of a, a, a long term relationship last year, and, and over the last you, you know um, I don't know a few months since then, better part of a year, I've been putting myself out there and trying to do so from the perspective of a man who's been doing the work on himself and is not trying to fall back into old habits. And I guess I'll, I'll start there, right? Because I I think for me at a young age, and I think this is sort of the norm, I, and, and for a lot of people who are, I would say emotionally intelligent, some might say just emotional, whatever it might be, but I think I was a, a far more expressive kid than the norm and I really did kind of carry my heart on my sleeve, I feel like. And growing up, that was always met with like a negative reaction amongst my friends, right? I was looked at as as like the soft one in the group, right? Like being in touch with my feelings was a negative growing up. And obviously, that was amongst guy friends. But ironically, I think because it's been so normalizing, right? And the idea of like what's attractive in a man being like this toughness and quote unquote manliness and it being like toxic uh, masculinity at the end of the day, that also is like ingrained into young girls into what is attractive about a man or what makes a man a man, right? And I think even for me, when it came to women, I was still sort of viewed as like too nice, right? And I can even specifically remember in in high school, you know, um, some of the girls saying like Danny well Danny's my real name they would say like Danny would be such a great boyfriend and they were they were you know so like somebody told me about this and they were all like yeah he really would and they kind of like giggled and that was it right it was this idea of like 
me being a good boyfriend because I was like a nice guy, nice to them, was almost like laughable, right? And I'm not gonna make it seem like you know I was wasn't um, like I was some kid who you know. I'm not gonna give you some sob story like I was like you know I'm like the swan who you know who uh, or whatever the goose who became a swan whatever whatever the ugly duck I don't know what the saying is the caterpillar that became a butterfly right you know I, uh, I I you know I did okay for myself I wasn't I wasn't by any means a ladies man but I was you know friends with a lot of a lot of popular kids and and I was um, you know around at the parties and I was cool with a lot of like the um, I don't know, not that any of this really matters in context, but like the girls I found attractive, I at least was like talking to them, right? Not Maybe not dating them the way I wanted to. I was probably more friend zone than anything else. Uh, but I mean, I did have a girlfriend in high school and, you know, uh, middle school and things like that. But like, there was, but there was just this notion. I, uh, you know, there's, I don't even know why I'm qualifying that. I, that, that might be my own ego, by the way. You were talking about mental health. That's something I need to work on. I'm qualifying that, um, you know, that I wasn't like, you know, a big nerd or something like that, as if there's anything wrong with that. Um, but I, I was somewhere in the middle. I was cool with everybody is what I should say. Um, now, if there's anything wrong with either one of those, if you're the nerd, God bless you. I love it. I love that. And if you were popular, awesome as well. Um, we all have different stories. I think I'm just like, I don't want, if anybody knew me before, then to make it seem like I'm giving you this like false perspective of like, I was a kid with no friends or something like that. And I'm also not trying to make it seem like I was like, you know, the ladies man or anything like that either. Um, anyway, that's, that's, these are, these, that's, some, uh, I would have talked to my therapist about why I felt the need to qualify that. But, but what I was saying is for me, all those years, and then even into my early twenties, it was like beaten into my head. You being the nice, emotionally intelligent guy is not getting you the results that you want, Right. And I was in a relationship from when I was like 18 to almost 22. And what I got out of that, and I started going out to like the bars and clubs with with my friends, they were all like getting the girls and I was kind of like the one always striking out, you know, and they were sort of like, I, I mentioned that one friend that was like to fight. He was one of the friends I was hanging out with. And they were sort of like your stereotypical kind of like jock, toxic, masculine energy. And they always got the girls. And I think for me, I ended up kind of getting my my heart broken a bit by one girl specifically in my 20s. And it kind of flipped a switch in me. It made me begin to sort of be that, that toxic, masculine dude, right? I... Um, I began to learn that, you know, through experiences that me being a womanizer is what would actually get me the girl that I wanted. And I'm not proud of that, but I think I was, you know, I always say I was like an F boy with a, a heart of gold. I feel like I was always a nice guy, but I definitely was like, you know, practicing certain F boy, um, I don't know, if strategies or just F boy tendencies, you know, without not on purpose, but that's sort of what I was trained through experiences and what I saw. Where I said I have, I, I don't want to no longer be the guy who's not getting the girls, right? Or, um, you know, because even with, like the the reality is with, with with guys as well. Oftentimes, the guys who are getting the girls, they don't want to hang out with the friend who also isn't getting girls, right? Because it's like you're looked at as like a liability almost, right? So it's almost like to gain the approval of my friends and for them to want to hang out with me, I had to become one of them to like also be somebody who was valuable in the mission of getting girls essentially. And, you know, I struggled a lot with my mental health because I think I also was like using women for validation, you know, and because I always felt like the outsider and because I was the softer kid, it was like I needed to hop on board with that and 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 sort of get all the attention that I wasn't getting back then, you know. And one of the ways I dealt with that was getting, you know, as many women as humanly possible to be interested in me, basically, right? And to be quite frank, 
because my I wasn't having any real emotional experiences or expression with my family or with my friends, I was using women just to kind of feel something, right? To sort of give me an escape from my depression. Because there is a, again, blanket statement, but general softness about a lot of women. And they're often a lot more in touch with their emotions and even create just a surface level place for you to be a little bit more expressive or just be even just being affectionate was like something that was like a relief from all the heaviness I was constantly carrying around, right? And again, when that was like done, that night was over or the situation ship ended, I was back to me and my dark and heavy thoughts and like, my drug of choice to forget that was women, you know, to not deal with it. And like I said, I did start therapy in, in my mid twenties and things like that, but I wasn't self-aware enough to kind of know what I was doing, right. To, to even really express it. And, and I don't even think my first therapist even used the word depression, right. I don't even remember that really being like a diagnosis that we had. And really was like my own journey with like recognizing that there is something more than just me being sad or whatever it might be and and being upset about particular situations like no depression is a very real thing and I don't you know and I think I was I was honestly scared to even use the word depression for the longest time that was such a heavy word to me like depression and suicide were at the same exact level that's how serious I took it. If I expressed that I was depressed, in my mind that immediately meant like I'm in a dark place where I'm going to take my own life. And I would never, you know, and that was like a scary thing to like even think about in my head. In my head, that's that's what depression was, being suicidal. And it wasn't until I began to educate myself and going to therapy and reading books and things like that, I recognized, oh, there are levels to this. And depression or anxiety is not a dirty word. And this is a bit more than just feeling sad about a particular situation or being upset or feeling a bit lonely. Like you genuinely, you know, experience and struggle with bouts of real depression and it's something you need to address. And through addressing that, I'm far more in touch with my feelings and my vulnerability and things of that nature. But even now, as I had mentioned earlier, like my friends and I, didn't grow up where we call each other, you know, maybe as kids, but as we got to teenagers and things like that, we weren't calling each other just to bullshit on the phone. We're not definitely not doing it in our 20s. And to be quite frank, in my 30s, I still don't do that. You know, the people that I'm close friends with, yeah, we have some deeper conversations every once in a while, but they're few and far in between. And even with that, you could tell we're all still kind of holding something back. And for me, the only times that I felt like I can let a bit loose and have a little bit more of a vulnerable conversation is with women. And even with that, I really don't engage unless I'm in a serious relationship, like as far as really letting somebody in. I'm very guarded about that because of my past trauma of it making me seem like lesser of a man or a woman seeing me as less masculine and as just a nice guy and not wanting to, you know, be anything more than friends, right? These all sort of have uh, become moments that are ingrained in my mind that come up when I feel like I'm when I'm sharing emotions or, or they they create an anxiety around me sharing something right. And again, I've done a lot of work. I'm still working on it. I still feel uncomfortable sometimes when me and my friends get into a deep conversation. Ironically, I feel comfortable talking on this podcast, and I feel comfortable talking to someone I'm in a a serious relationship with. Outside of that, it makes me incredibly uncomfortable to talk about my emotions. And honestly, even when I post clips from this podcast, like if I take a clip and put it on my my Instagram, if it's a deep clip, like I'm talking about like probably something from this, I'm going to feel uncomfortable about it. I'm not even going to want to read the comments. I'm not even going to want to like, I'm going to like post it and just like set it and forget it. Because I don't even, I'm so anxious about the world knowing any of these things. But that's what's been ingrained in me as a human, but I think specifically as a man, because then I think about all my guy friends from back home who are going to be like, who are going to like make fun of me or whatever it might be. That's all still ingrained in me. 
right? Being made fun of for just expressing how I feel, as crazy as that sounds. And to be fair, what I've noticed now as somebody dating who's a bit more aware of what he wants and what a healthy relationship looks like, many women that I've been interacting with, they still have a real negative connotation around a man expressing his emotions, his feelings, and being vulnerable, right? And one thing I've been trying to really get good at is having boundaries and saying, hey, this is behavior that I'll accept in a relationship, and this is what I won't accept. And I'm going to be very honest with you when I feel like you've overstepped that or you've done something that bothers me. And even if it's small, I'm not here to make a big deal about it, but I know I want to address it now before it builds up into something where I become resentful and it comes out at the wrong time. Because I want to address it upfront in a healthy manner so we can just keep on moving on with our lives. But what I've noticed is some women still view that as a sign of like weakness. right? I had a, a, an interaction where I, I went on a, a date, a couple of dates with, with this girl. And our, our second date, it just felt a little bit off, you know, like her energy, her vibe. I just feel like she kind of had um, a bit of an attitude throughout the night and just kind of, I just wasn't feeling it. And, you know, we had gone to like this, what was supposed to be what I read online, like this amazing, interactive, immersive experience in New York. It was a dud. It was horrendous. But I was like trying to be a good sport about it. I was making fun of it. We were trying to make light of it. I thought we were on the same page, whatever. And when we went out to dinner, um... I mean, throughout the night, her whole vibe was just off. I, I, I'm trying not to give, like, details because I, I don't think it's fair. But, like, um, you know, she she just, like, wasn't being, you know, very friendly. It was like she had, like, this attitude and was, like, kind of snotty. Um, and this was new because before that, we'd gone out before and everything was great. And when we sat down to dinner, I, I just kind of, like, I was like, you know what? It's bothering me. I feel like the vibe, the energy is off. She's just kind of making like these side offhand comments that are like, you know, um, not even, I don't know, like they're just, it just feels like snotty and kind of bratty and it's just like not even funny. It just feels like it's unnecessarily like just, ugh, I don't know how to explain it. So I, I kind of was just like, you know what? This is a good practice. Let me just address what I'm feeling in the moment. I'm not going to make a big deal about it, but let me just address this so we can kind of move past it. And like in my mind, I want to be healthy and be like, hey, this is bothering me. I just wanted to like bring it up to you so we can now like just move past it and enjoy the rest of our night. And I feel like I tried to set it up in that way. And I was just kind of like, uh, I had made, I've made like light of it, like a joke. I was like, listen, you know, before we cheers, I was like, let's like, the, it, or, I feel like our energy is a little bit off. Let's just like cheers and, and, you know, clear our energy or whatever. And then that turned into like this whole other thing where it was just a really uncomfortable experience, almost like a, a polite combative back and forth unnecessarily like she got very defensive about some of the things i had mentioned and and from my perspective i really was trying to make it a point to like be as light about it and not even make it an argument i make it a thing i just wanted to have it be out there i wanted to express this is what this is what i'm feeling in the moment not making a big deal about it but i just want to like get it out there so i'm not holding anything in and it became like this kind of combative thing from from her perspective and she made it into this thing of like oh my god your ego your male ego is bruised uh because the date was a bad date so it was like she was making it mean something completely different it was like i couldn't just express like i just feel a little bit off right now our energies are a little bit off it was like god forbid you express something that means your male ego is hurt or whatever right and for me that was okay this is a sign that this person at this point in their life as as great of a human being as i really do believe they are can't receive feedback in a healthy way as far as me just being able to be open and honest about something that bothered me this this isn't like a safe space for me to be able to be honest and even when i say that I feel like such a fucking loser saying a safe space. Oh, this is a safe. I want a safe space to talk about my feelings. Like that feel that like gives me the ick. But it's it's real. It's healthy, right? I can't just ignore it and pretend like everything is fine, and there's not something bothering me. 
And then all of a sudden, fucking two years down the line, I have all this pent up aggression and annoyance at this person because I don't feel like I could ever tell them anything. Right. That was what I was trying to do there. And maybe it was. And, you know, quite frankly, it probably was a subconscious test of let me see if this is the type of person because I'm looking for a serious relationship. So let me see if this type of person where we can have discussions about things that bothered us and not have it be a gigantic fight. It's something we address the other person. Um does their best to remedy it and we move on. I got it out of my, I got it out of me. You know, I, I'm not gonna hold on to these emotions and we move on with our life. And that, and obviously that was not the person that I could do that with. And, you know, I had a similar situation happen with another person I had been talking to. And, and again, these are great girls. Like, like um, you know, in, in this one, things were getting kind of serious. We had been on a few dates and, and been taught, we would talk every day and FaceTime and all these things. But there were a couple things that, the like healed version of me or the healing version of me, because I don't think we're ever quite healed, but the healing version of me, just like it didn't gel with, right? And one of those things was the topic of depression, right? She sort of still had this early mindset of the idea of depression and suicide being like completely linked at the same level. And paraphrasing what she said from my recollection, it was sort of the idea of like today we sort of exaggerate the idea of depression when sometimes people are just sad or going through some sadness. And it sort of was coming off the back of me sort of just sharing with her a bit of what I was going through. It, and I was like not even – I was just soft sort of um, soft launching my depression at that, at that moment, right? And this was happened to be just during a period, a, a couple of weeks where I was like really questioning a lot of things. And, and I definitely was having like a bit of a depressive wave come over me. Right. And I was, and as somebody that I was like beginning to really develop feelings for and trying to see if they fit in my life in the long term, I began to let her in. And again, one of the things I was met with was when I would use the word depression, it was the idea of like, but that's not, you're not really depressed. You just said, don't throw the word around depression like that, right? And that kind of was like, you know, oh, okay, I, I this doesn't feel completely, I hate this stupid word, but it's, the you know, I have to just get over it. It doesn't feel completely safe, right, that I can express myself here because she's sort of minimizing my experience or telling me what my, my lived experience is. And I don't think we could ever tell somebody what their experience is. We can give them a place to express it and allow their experience to be their experience. It doesn't have to make complete sense to us in order for us to be there for them. And I think the worst thing we can do is try and tell somebody what their experience is. So that was one of the things that like really popped up for me with her. And then kind of the thing that led to us sort of calling things off and, and ending things. Again, I'm, I'm being very like cognizant of setting boundaries, right? And we were on the phone one night and, and I was really kind of just, I, w I was really knee deep in, in my depression at that point and was kind of just expressing it. And yeah, I wasn't like the most fun person to talk to at the time, but I thought she was somebody that I could sort of just let that down and, and let certain things out. And again, I wasn't, you know, targeting her with my, sadness or anger and taking it out on her I was merely just venting about all that I was feeling and it was sort of some of your you know your worst fears realized especially for me in my own experiences as a man and and feeling like I couldn't share these things or that people didn't care or you know they didn't think it was real or relevant you know we're we're on FaceTime and she's like um I could see her like I don't know if she's texting or whatever it was, but it was like, oh, I don't have her full attention. And again, I brought it up right then and there, you know, because I'm, I'm trying to be really mature and trying to view, have very clear boundaries and like not hold on to resentment. I just I want to let you know you did something that that bothered me and made me feel a type of way. I want to talk it out with you so we can move on with our lives. Right. In a healthy way. And she kind of like tried to brush it off like I'm listening type of thing but it's like it's kind of disrespectful to me if if you're telling me something serious and heartfelt and I'm like very obviously doing something else right I don't feel like I have your full attention you don't really care and again that's my own projection but I'm I'm letting you know what it what it feels like so that maybe you cannot do that right and then um you know that that was fine and and 
you know, um, we kept it light and kind of smirked about it, but you know, she stopped doing that. And then at some point in the conversation, you know, it was like, you're kind of a brat is what she said to me. And it was in the moment, I didn't really like think much of it, but you know, I mean, and it's be honest, the word brat didn't even bother me that much. It was like, what it was, it was whatever, but it was like, the same sort of, I was met with the same, I think, logic that many men are met with. Like, you're just complaining. Like, stop complaining. And literally me, I'm like, dude, I'm fucking depressed. I'm, I'm trying to, like, let you know. And it's like, I'm allowed to be depressed and allowed to be sad. Regardless of how amazing my life is, I'm allowed to have moments where... I'm just don't feel it, right? Especially somebody who battles with depression. It doesn't matter if I have my dream job and I'm working on things that I'm passionate about and I have a great life. I struggle with this. It's not me being a brat and being ungrateful. This is something that I struggle with. And you're brushing it off as me just being basically this ungrateful person. And then what felt like to me, and she combated this later, but what felt like to me as a very abrupt end to our conversation, she was basically just like, well, you're in a funky mood tonight. I'm going to let you go get some sleep. And again, that is so like, I don't, demeaning is not the word, but it it's like you're not qualifying my emotions you're not validating them you're it's it's you're that's so incredibly invalidating right and me going back to my old programming of shutting down was basically just like all right good night and that was it I hung up and the conversation ended obviously i didn't feel good about it i sat there in bed just like looking at the wall like what the fuck just happened but again as a man it was a reinforcement of you being vulnerable, you expressing emotions is not okay. But on the reverse of it, she had done the same. And I, I, this isn't like a, I'm not, I, I feel bad. I feel like I'm like, you know, destroying this girl's like character. Even though nobody knows who she is. Um, but I'm not a beautiful person. But there were times she came to me and expressed frustration and stuff. And it was things that weren't necessarily gigantic deals, but I gave her a safe space and I was there for her. I held space and I was emotionally supportive and empathetic for her, to her and, and what she was experiencing. But as a man, I wasn't given the same thing. And to make a long story short, you know, we, we ended up having a conversation, you know, whatever, um, not that night, but, you know, shortly after and, it still felt very invalidating, right? It was like, it was like, oh, I'm sorry you felt that way, rather than like, I'm sorry I did something to make you feel that way, right? And and the whole thing really sort of left me feeling uneasy. Like I, I just felt like I didn't feel seen, didn't feel heard, and it was like, this is not going to be something that's healthy for me in the long run. And I and you know, and again being expressive i was like listen i'm at a point in my life where i've i've had the chaotic relationships i've had the relationships of giant explosions where we can't just have a, a conversation in a calm manner or talk talk through something and move on with our lives and again th this wasn't even like that big of a deal the like what we were talking about it should have been a very easy kind of like a cut and dry talk it out okay okay you're right yep that bothered me thank you for you know understanding that you did something about me let's move on with our lives right i wasn't like you know ignoring her calls or going or, or being angry and think like that i was ready to just talk it out normally but as i said you know as i'm explaining like i want peace in my life i don't want to have to wonder what you're thinking you're going through these explosive relationships blah 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 right i was very clear like this is my boundary this is what i want and you know, her response to that was, okay, I think maybe we're in different places in our life. And basically that was it. That was how it ended. And that sort of like left me feeling a bit like 
almost my old logic. Oh, maybe I shouldn't be so vulnerable or maybe I shouldn't express emotions or the things that bother me because it's not being received well by the opposite sex, right? They're seeing it as me being too emotional, me having a fragile ego, me, me, you know, being extra is one word, um, or me, me just being a brat and being ungrateful, basically. And I kind of had to talk myself off that ledge and say, hey, regardless of what is the quote unquote norm, I know that for me, this is far healthier and as frustrating as an experience as it's been sort of one after the other of meeting people who have maybe a skewed understanding of emotion and vulnerability and masculinity. I also have to stay true to what keeps me healthy mentally because I don't want to go to that place where I'm constantly depressed. I don't want to go to that place where I have so much pent up aggression and frustration that I hold it back until it explodes in places that doesn't that don't deserve it, right? Or on people that don't deserve it. And what I've realized is how rare it is as a man to be able to express yourself and showcase your emotions in a calm way and it be met with open arms and understanding and empathy. And I think that speaks to so much of why this is a crisis and why something like Men's Mental Health Awareness Month is so important because we don't have many places to feel like we can share. And I think as a result, many people will revert to unhealthy things to either numb the pain or to just let it out. And the last example I'll give, I had gone on on another date and, you know, I'm open about talking about therapy and depression and mental health. And, you know, we got into a conversation about that and, um, it somehow got in the conversation where I was like, yeah, you know, I, I took antidepressants for a little bit. And this girl's reaction was like, oh, I would never do that. And she, and then it was also like, you poor thing. And in the moment, you know, and obviously I, she's a nice girl. I, you know, we're, we're cool. We're not, you know, romantically involved, but I see her time time and she's a really nice girl. Um, but I think it's again, that lack of understanding. And it was almost like, you're almost over empathizing made me feel like there was something wrong with me, right? Also, your reaction to saying you personally never do it made it feel like, oh, uh, there's something wrong with me for, ta- for you know, seeking antidepressants because I was extremely depressed. Um, but again, on the flip side of it, almost like being babied and coddled, like made to feel like, there, again, there's something wrong with me because I was addressing my mental health. And again, we're all products of our environment, of societal norms and all of these things. But, you know, I think these are the conversations that aren't often addressed, you know. And even quite frankly, it's uncomfortable. I feel uncomfortable even sharing this. There's a part of me as I'm recounting these stories to you, uh, uh, you know, here. I'm like, am I going to sound like a, you know, like a like a loser for for this am i wrong am i being too soft maybe i am over exaggerating right all of that is running to my head as i'm recounting this like i'm almost like telling you what i felt but then i'm like telling myself i think you might have been crazy for feeling that maybe she was right but again because it's so deeply ingrained god forbid i feel something and want to express it you know like it's like if, if i express anything like it's almost like as a man i'm only allowed to express the like worst thing so it's like okay yeah you can be upset if i cheat on you or do something really crazy other than that keep your mouth shut there you have nothing there's no nothing else to express and if you express anything else you're being extra you're exaggerating you're blowing things out of proportion you're being soft you're being overly emotional toughen up and it's like 
No, it shouldn't take the most extreme thing for me to be allowed to express emotion. There's a wide range of emotions that we all go through, and I shouldn't have to hold them back until it's something extreme that like anybody can, you know, um, agree with, you know, why somebody would blow up about. It's like there are day to day things that you're allowed to express that bother you. And I think women are allowed to do so, right? We make jokes about like, you know, those memes of like girls being like, if I was a fish, would you still love me? Right? Stupid things like that. And if that's somebody expressing like, oh, I want you to, you know, reiterate how much you love me or, or express emotion towards me. But it's like on the flip side, as a man, we're expected to never feel any of those emotions or to ever have any insecurity about how much our partner feels about us or to want to just hear it sometimes, right? It's a double standard there. As a woman, you're allowed to. As a man, you're like, you're, there's something wrong with you. You know, you're being, you're being a woman essentially, right? It's like, you're not being masculine. It's a turnoff. And I think those are the things that create the issues that we see with men and their mental health and it not being addressed. So I don't just want to share, I guess, in my own personal experience. I know it went kind of long, but um, I hope that helped somebody out there. Now we'll, uh, we'll tie everything we talked about today in a neat little bow in a segment we call Conclusion Stew. Time for Conclusion Stew. All right, so I'll keep this really short and sweet. I know I this episode is going to be a little longer than I, I intended, but from this article, I think the thing that really stands out to me is men in the United States die by suicide at a rate four times, four times higher than women. And men are diagnosed with depression and mood disorders at a far lower rate than women. And men who have even been diagnosed are getting help at a far less rate than women. So obviously there is an issue, there is stigma, there might be a health bias, um, men also just not wanting to get the help for fear of judgment, right? I relate to that 100%. So that's why these conversations are so important. When we talk about why these months exist or events exist, it's to keep up awareness, to keep the conversations alive so that those who feel like they can't share or be themselves or express themselves know that they do have a safe place to do so that we, the world, are opening our arms and our hearts to, to them to be able to live their truth and not hold things inside. So that's why June being Mental Health Awareness Month is so important, and this week being International Men's Health Week, I think um, just incredible to have these conversations. And, you know, that's why I shared my own story. I'm, I'm, like, literally in my own mind cringing if certain people hear this or whatever, and I'm like, did I share too much? You know, but again, that's old toxic programming. Me thinking that I have to be perfect, that I have to be this tough guy all the time, that I can't have emotions, that I can't be vulnerable, that in order for me to be attractive to the opposite sex, I have to be, you know, alpha man all the time and nothing bothers me, you know, and and I'm just a tough guy walking around here, you know, shirt off, just drinking a beer, you know, and that's just not real life, right? Just like there are things that I'm going to do that's going to bother my partner, um, and they're going to express it to me, I should be able to do the same exact thing. And I shouldn't have to wait until it's all these pent up things that I can't even hold it inside anymore that I just explode. And I shouldn't, it shouldn't have to be that I only can express something when there's an extreme, gigantic, catastrophic event that happened that now it's justified for me to have any emotion whatsoever. I think in a healthy relationship, both people, both sides should be allowed to in the moment, address something that bothered them, have a healthy dialogue where the other person is open and wanting to remedy the situation, and you both can move on from it. Just like boundaries are important. This is what I need out of a relationship and what I want, and I'm not going to accept anything less. And you're allowed to have boundaries as well. And it's my job to hopefully meet those. And if I can't, I don't want to, then I'm not the person for you. But we're both allowed to express those things. And even the things about like, oh, depression is, o is only, you know, basically like the most extreme things. That's just not real. You know, I've done enough with my therapist and my psychiatrist when I was doing antidepressants. There's a scale. It's a medical scale that, you know, has varying levels of depression and, and for anxiety as well. 
You don't have to be the most extreme case. And if you are, there's nothing wrong with that. But there are varying levels of it. And it's very real. And it should be treated as such and treated with kindness and empathy. And again, you don't have to understand it completely to have empathy for somebody else. It's And I think more than anything, just because you don't understand it or haven't experienced it, you don't get to tell somebody else what their experience is. That's their lived experience. And regardless of their gender, everybody should be able to have safe spaces to express themselves, um, particularly amongst the closest people to them in their lives, their loved ones, right? And, you know, one thing I want to work on, even as I say, I, I got to be better at opening up to those around me, my friends, and, and stop making it weird to have emotions, right? I can do better with that. And, and listen, I will say that me being open on this podcast, posting clips on social media, and just talking about it publicly, I've noticed more of my guy friends sort of coming to me and testing the waters of, of having some of these deeper conversations. And I'm grateful for that. And um, I think it's something I need to, to work on and get better at. And I encourage all of us to do so and, and recognizing that like anybody out there suffering with, with anything, your family member, whatever it might be, it's an ongoing process. You know, the healing never stops. You're never completely healed. These are, are things that we just keep getting better at, right? I'm at a place where I'm no longer bottling shit up and flipping out, right? Or I'm no longer holding back when I feel something just to make the other person feel more comfortable, right? I'm getting more comfortable with expressing what I need and what I'm feeling in that moment and being okay with the fact that someone may not receive that, but it's not up to me to bend to make them comfortable. I have to do what's best for me at the end of the day. And again, like I expressed, sometimes I go back and forth where I'm like, am I justified at what I'm feeling? And I'm, maybe I'm blowing this out of proportion. I have to just trust my intuition that if I'm feeling something, it's real and it deserves to be expressed. And if the other per and if, as long as I express it in a healthy manner, And not like blaming or not with anger, but with love and, and just wanting to share and and work through it with this person. So I know my intentions were pure in that way. Then it's not on me if the other person can't hold space for me and my emotions. Doesn't make me weak. In fact, again, as I mentioned earlier, to me, the hardest thing is being vulnerable. That's the toughest thing to do. So... I actually think on the opposite side of it, any man who is expressing their feelings, their emotions, being vulnerable, opening up about things is actually tougher than any of these dudes that are holding it in and and sort of exploding outwardly in, in the midst of like fist fights or screaming matches or whatever it might be. Like, yeah, on the surface, that stuff might look tough, but they're taking the easy route. It's easy to bottle all this up and then just revert to like our most raw instinct of punching a hole in the wall. That's easy. What's hard is actually addressing it, going through the emotions, processing it, sharing it with another person if you if it involves them or you just want to get it out, which you should. That's what's actually tough to actually really work through the emotion rather than just like randomly taking it out and sort of half releasing it on some random person or inanimate object, you know. Um, so just all things to think about. Uh, and I'm, I'm happy that we're able to talk about on the show today. And I hope hope this helps somebody out there um, and maybe broadens our perspective of masculinity and maybe some of the things that, that men go through um, that's not spoken about quite enough. So with that said, thank you all so much for tuning in. We'll be back on Thursday with our Thursday Trends episode. Until then, stay safe. Check on the men in your life. Um, use this as a month to have awareness for that and to, to hold space. Um, yeah, until uh, next episode, stay safe. I'll talk soon. Peace.